I think, if memory serves, the last time this room was this full on the occasion of a Brother Robert lecture, the lecturer was in fact Brother Robert. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yay. That might be all the introduction our lecturer needs. Of course, since I'm an integral graduate, I will add something. <laughs> In the year of our Lord, 1993, I was introduced to Brother L. Rayfield on the occasion of the integral mathematics tutorial, sophomore mathematics tutorial. And at some point during that year, I was asked to do an exposition of the epicycle of Venus, which I duly did, in the style of the time, which was in a spiral notebook with, in pen with neat annotations. And the came, time came to deliver it to His Majesty I ripped it out of a spiral notebook and handed it to him with enormous pride. I got it back, unread, with the spiral stuff neatly trimmed, pulled <laughs> it off the paper and stapled to the thing in a note to the effect, I'll take your work seriously when you do. <laughs> 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 it's really, that's nothing like the Don Rag I got from Jim Lindsner one year when I sat down. He looked at me and said, Mr. Cartwright is a very voluble student in the music tutorial. Next semester he will have renewed opportunities to listen. <laughs> <laughs> and Don Rag. Truly, Brother L. Raphael Patton needs no introduction. He's taught nearly all of us one aspect of the program or another, and since I have absolutely no idea what his opinions are on the book of Jonah, I, I give you Brother L. Rayford, who will disclose. When we were students in this room, it used to be the chemistry lecture room. <coughs> And I sat about there, and it was about this full. Those were the good old days. <laughs> I wouldn't do that again for a million years. I hope to leave, get this kind of over, and then leave you some time if you want to argue. But we'll see how it works out. We should be out of here by 7. <laughs> Brother Robert is the founder and the father of this program. Being asked to give this lecture, Brother Robert's lecture, is certainly an honor, and thanks to the program for inviting an aged former tutor. Few of us are left who knew Brother Robert. He left the college for St. John's in Annapolis many years ago, and returned to die quietly in Napa in 2006. Nonetheless, you should meet him in this little story. Robert spoke nearly perfect French, and he spent many summers in Paris. We were together there some 40 years back. A night out in the first arrondissement for beef tech au frit <laughs> included two bottles of good claret, and as usual, we covered philosophy, spirituality, and the mess at the college. <laughs> now it was around midnight, and we started back to his apartment in the 8th. A very comical combination. One very tall, and one very, very short. <laughs> the long march west on the Rue de Faubourg saint Honoré was made tolerable it's midnight, by our singing the Marseillaise very loudly. <laughs> Rouget de Lille would have been proud of us. You could look that up on Google. <laughs> it takes about a block to do one stanza. Suddenly on our left was the Elysee Palace, the residence of the President Georges Pompidou. Guards were at the gate armed and glaring at us. But we kept on singing without a care in the world, and they held fire, and we marched on. <laughs> now you know what Brother Robert was like. 
In the middle of the 50s, Robert, 1950s, <laughs> Robert and James Haggerty, along with brothers Edmund and Brendan, worked on building the program here at the college. The integrated program grew out of an older tradition, Winky Barr and Scott Buchanan out of Chicago, following Robert Maynard Hutchins and Mortimer Adler. And Barr and Buchanan set up the program at St. John's in 1937. So for about 80 years, the program has been unchanged until recently. <laughs> at Annapolis, Santa Fe, Santa Paula, our daughter, as well as here at Moraga. At the very heart of the program are the text and the discussion it provokes. And it's precisely there that the problems and the misunderstandings start. We can divide the battlefield into two groups. First, the advocates of dialectic. This group tends to collect philosophers and rhetoricians. They focus on the text to provoke a discussion, and an argument, we might say. The dialectic proceeds on issues and problems as raised or as suggested by the text. These topics, arising naturally, cover a lot of ground, but they do tend to string together from Homer down to today. The other camp are the advocates of literature. These do not necessarily include English teachers, but that's the way to bed. You'll get that later. <laughs> Indeed, include our historians and cultural sociologists, and so on and so on. Their view is that the texts are meant to expose the students to different cultures, to put history into context, to appreciate the styles and expressions of the author. Thus, texts must be chosen as representing different cultures, as giving cultural context, as fostering a sensitivity to literary style and a great emphasis on writing is the hallmark of this camp. Put most bluntly, we have over here those who like to think, and over there those who would rather think about thinking. <laughs> we should be clear that the program falls, we hope, largely in the first camp. Dialectic and rhetoric are the whole point. The texts we deal with are indeed literature, and that's left to further work outside the program. Background material may be searched out by the reader. Lectures by experts may be heard, giving new opinions and perhaps, perhaps some insight. Today, we're going to do Jonah, not Job. <laughs> We've already done Job, haven't we? Yes, we Job. Uh, we'll do Jonah, and, and the lecture is purposely built to take account of both camps and you can sort out where that occurs. <laughs> On one side, we take the test as given in English translation, and we take it seriously. On the other, we will look around for background bits of history and outside knowledge. So, maybe Jonah. For some time, readers of the prophecy of Jonah have had crises of faith. How could anyone believe that a whale swallowed a man, shoes and all, and for three days tried to digest him and his shoes. How can the word of God be taken seriously when it forces on us such an absurd story? No one's faith should be tried by reading this tale. On the other hand, how do those who accept scripture as coming from the very lips of God make any sense of this book? Can they really believe that God would bring a whale to eat a man for the sake of some moral lesson? Something is wrong. We might read the book once more with care. The prophecy opens easily enough, and I call it prophecy. Verses 1 and 2. You take care of that. I'm not going to read it again. <laughs> Unlike most other prophecies, not all, but most. This one is a third-person narrative. We do not hear the prophet's voice. Some unknown author 
is telling the story. Although no one else named Jonah appears in the Old Testament, the name has since acquired great popularity and come down to us as Eunice in Semitic, as Johan, Giovanni, Juan, Ivan, Ivo, Evan, Jean, John, and John. Everybody has an account of that name. In the Gospels, Peter is said to be the son of John. And both men are identified as fishermen. It's an accident. <laughs> there are two more Johns. The Baptist, who spends some time in the water. <laughs> and the Apostle John, who ends his gospel with what? Blood and water. The word Jonah may mean dove, or as some other translators claim, something like God is gracious. More interesting to me is the fact that his father, Amittai, I, he's been dead for so long I don't know how you pronounce it, means truth. So Jonah is the son of truth. Actually, the book of Kings, 2 Kings, talks about Jonah, the same Jonah. And it says in the 23rd verse of the uh, 14th chapter of the 2nd Kings, In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, the king of Judah, Jeroboam, the, the son of Joash, etc., etc. The Lord God of Israel spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from gath Hefer. So now you know he's accounted for twice, this probably is a genuine prophet, or at least a reference to one. And we know where he came from, Gath Hefer, which I'm told is near Nazareth, but who knows. So our text may be, after all, no fairy tale, but some hint of history lingers around the edge. Jonah heard a divine order to preach, not to Israel, but to the Assyrians. This assignment would be similar to leaving your pulpit in Prairie Hen, Nebraska to preach reform in downtown Los Angeles. <laughs> it's in an understandable panic the preacher tries to escape. Verse 3. The prophet heads west in the opposite direction from Nineveh. No one is quite sure where Tarshish is. Spain is a possibility. But the reference is that the ships of Solomon went to Tarshish and returned in three years. So it's not across the street. <laughs> it was surely far away. Not even the Lord had made it that far. <clears throat> but the Lord did notice the prophet's expensive flight. Verses 4, 5, of chapter 1. And then comes the, the sailing. And you get a very strange scene. Not the impressive storm, nor the shouts of sailors chucking stuff overboard, could rouse the prophet from his bed in the hold. He was not sleeping. The sleep of the just. <laughs> then verses 6, 7, 8. Close them? Go ahead. The men knew, as sailors tend to know, that something was not right on board. Such a storm was not normal. When their passenger drew the short straw, their suspicion was confirmed. This fellow was bad news. As the ship was tossed on the waves, poor Jonah was forced to be frank with the jury, while not altogether abandoning his job as a preacher. Verses 9, 10, 11, and 12. Jonah was more than frank. In order to appease the god of the storm, he promised, or he proposed that he join the cargo being thrown overboard. 
The somewhat pious sailors resisted this suggestion, but to no effect. Verses 13, 14, 15, and 16. You may hear an echo here of Caiaphas, who had the decision to let one man die for the good of many. That's a quote from the Gospel of John. Burdened with a murder, the crew seems to have taken the prophet's words seriously and leaving behind their own gods, mentioned in verse 5, came to worship the Lord in making promises. So the preacher succeeded, at least there. As he falls into the waves, Jonah has done his job of delivering God's message, at least to the sailors, but that is not the end of it. And you come to verse 17. A glance at the translation of this text shows us that the whale is a great fish, Dagadol in Hebrew. The Vulgate calls it a Pishim Grandum, accusative. Luther has einen großen Fisch. <laughs> the Septuagint has ketos me mega. All of that means a very big fish. It is no surprise that the fish later became a whale, <coughs> much more dramatic but less likely in the eastern Mediterranean. And by the time the Gospels were translated into European and English, the whale had found a permanent place here. There's a funny reference in the book of Tobias, which I didn't realize until it was brought to my attention. Tobias chapter 6, verse 2. Uh, Raphael is there with the boy on the river. Raphael, thank you. <laughs> then the young man went down to wash himself in the river. A fish leaped up from the river and would have swallowed the young man. That's a funny reference. Nobody, I suspect, has ever run across it before. When was the last time you read the book of Tobit? Forty years ago. There you go. Thank you. Matthew 12, verse 40. Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. And the Vulgate says, Tribus diebus et tribus noctibus. And Luther says, Drei nechte and dry target. My question would be, how would you know if you were inside? <laughs> it's just strange, these little bits and pieces. Some claim that for the occasion, the Lord had created a real beast, huge and able to swallow a man alive, suggesting that this thing was unique. These guesses may be set aside. What happens next is important. And Jonah sings that song of desperation from inside. We don't know who recorded it. <laughs> the whale. <laughs> That's chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. And it's a very pretty little song, by the way. Jonah's hymn, delivered from the belly of hell, Sheol, is eloquent and leads us to see what is truly going on. God's messenger was trying to get away from the Lord in a futile flight. Faced with calamity as a result of that flight, he praises and invokes the Lord. Even with death staring him in the face, Jonah asks for, and seems to expect, divine aid. While well aware of his cowardice, the prophet remains a prophet, then indeed the Lord hears his prayer. And then verse 10. And the Lord spake under the fish, and it vomited Jonah upon the dry land. First, Jonah was taken from the belly of the ship and thrown out. Now he's taken from the belly of the fish and thrown up. That can't be anything 
like a coincidence. <laughs> Has no one noticed that this great fish is able to hear the voice of God? I think it's odd enough that Jonah can't, let alone the whale. <laughs> Extraordinary. Of course, the great fish is a contrivance, a fictional vehicle to deliver Jonah from himself and return him to his assignment. There is no need for faith to take on the existence of sea monsters eating Hebrew preachers. It seems that the monster is placed there to bring Jonah to his senses. His flight from God has landed him in hell, a dark night of the soul. The truth of the narrative is concealed behind this marine scenery. Now, taken literally, the second part of the narrative is equally unbelievable. Chapter 3, verses 1, 2, and 3. The prophet is not allowed to forget his mission. The message must be delivered. The Assyrians are wicked and should be dealt with. At the same time, the enormous Assyrian capital, hundreds of miles, hundreds of miles from Galilee, was a very frightening place to a simple man from the provinces. More than that, the very aggressive Assyrian army had been threatening Israel and her neighbors for some time. And Byron tells us quite musically, The Assyrians came down like the sheep on the fold, no. the cohorts were gleaming in silver and gold. Came down like a... A wolf on the fold, sorry. And his cohorts were gleaming in purple, and then the sheen of their spears was like the stars of the sea, when the blue wave rolls mightily, nightly on deep Galilee. The destruction of Sennacherib, 1815. The Assyrian army was not known for its charm. <laughs> Assyria, its capital, and the army became bywords for invasion, conquest, and terror. We have a report, actually, from those days, no joke. Part of it says, I destroyed, I demolished, I burned. I cut off their noses, their ears, and fingers, and I put out the eyes of many of the soldiers. These are serious guys. Nineveh itself is interesting. To cross the city takes three days, we are told. I can get across San Francisco in an afternoon, and I'm a big old fat guy. I've done it. <laughs> What ought to be noticed, and once again now it's a, in a case of outside information, the root of the word Nineveh in Semitic is fish. How long to go through the center of the city? Oh. It's a, it can't be just a coincidence. Like the first fish, this one was an imaginative construction. No city was like that. Nineveh was big. The outer walls of the actual city were said to have been maybe 50 miles in length. Perhaps a three-day journey around. Maybe. Not through. The royal palace was not in the center. It was on the western edge, near the gate where Jonah would have come in. So you didn't have to go to the king. When you came, he was there. <coughs> Remember, this is not an eyewitness account, but rather a tale. Prepared to deliver the news of its gloom, our Jonah hit the road and somehow made his way to the great capital in the northeast. Verses 3, no, I'm sorry, chapter 3, verse 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. And that's the thing where they, they listen to him. Clearly, this account is as absurd as that of the man-eating whale. Who could believe that a street preacher would make a dent on this commercial metropolis? That merchants and nobles would leave their business and repent? The emperor, a general whose vast power and cruelty were legendary, repents. But how could this lord of the world be so deeply shaken by a travel-worn prophet 
sporting a rural Galilean costume. And worse, did Jonas speak Assyrian? <laughs> or did the Ninevites understand Hebrew? There are problems with this narrative. One would have to deal to be deaf, sorry. One would have to be deaf to miss the overwhelming sarcasm layered into this account. Hungry cows in sackcloth? <laughs> Fasting goats and donkeys? And then hundreds, thousands, dropping very lucrative occupations of repression and extortion, leaving their banks and shops to repent of their wickedness and violence. This is a tall tale and nothing more. It could not have happened any more than having poor Jonah living inside a big fish for three days. Now, are we attacking sacred scripture? That's your question, isn't it? <laughs> Were not the scriptures to be believed as divinely inspired? Are they not the very word of God? But the Lord may have a sense of humor. <laughs> Perhaps a small suggestion would help our understanding. Consider modern Jewish humor, fueled by irony and self-criticism, heavy with sarcasm. The biblical writer is giving us a heavy dose of such stand-up accent. I'm sorry, stand-up stagecraft. It would be revealing to recite the whole prophecy with a Yiddish accent. Try it sometime. <laughs> this is not to ignore its significance. It is rather to situate the whole book of Jonah more rationally. That was a word we used this morning in our seminar. More rationally within the story of salvation. Finally, the last bit, which is always a problem. The reaction of God to the response of the Ninevites causes an unexpected reaction in the prophet. Chapter 3, 10, and then chapter 4, 1 through, 5, 1 through 4. It might be necessary to read that section a couple of times, and some of you, I think, must have, because it doesn't work very well. Jonah is unhappy, exceedingly unhappy. One of the translations said, the word is not angry, it's depressed in Hebrew. He's depressed. That lends a different cast to the story. Because God did not punish the Assyrians as he had threatened. Jonah seems to have been looking forward to sulfur and brimstone, but the merciful Lord relented when the people repented of their sins. Yes, Jonah felt his job foretelling doom was not respected. And so he sulked, but in the shade. Verses, chapter 4, verses 5, 6, 7, and 8. The new characters in the story, the gourd and the worm, deserve a note. Outside information again. Gourd is a very bad translation. Everybody knows that, but nobody knows what the true translation is. Some people have thought it may have been something like ivy or a vine of some kind. And the booth that Jonah built is the well-known tabernacle found elsewhere in scripture. It was a rustic enclosure to use in recalling the wandering of Israel in the desert, Leviticus 23. The Feast of Tabernacles was one of the big three of the feast and is mentioned several times in the gospel. Jesus observed the Feast of Tabernacles. The booth was required to be roofed over with some, necessarily, by law, vegetation. The walls could be anything, cloth, whatever you got, but the roof had to be vegetation. Don't ask me why. The troublesome worm that kills the bush is and uh, comes up in the scorching condemnation of Nineveh by another prophet, Nahum, chapter 3, 
There shall, and he's talking about Nineveh, there shall the fire devour thee, the sword shall cut off the, cut thee off, it shall eat thee up like the canker worm, make thyself many as the canker worm, make thyself many as the locusts. Thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of heaven, the canker worm spoileth and fleeth away. Now, another thing that's a matter of coincidences, a great east wind again, again, pl uh, plagues Jonah, knocks down his little house. Just as the great wind threatened his escape to Tarshish, probably from the east, the winds were described as huge, as were the fish, and was Nineveh, the fish, the city of the fish. The wind may well have blown the cover from his booth, or even blown the whole booth away, leaving him sitting there with no shade. For a second time, in another of his dramatic gestures, Jonah wishes for death. Again. His grand message had been received, but Nineveh survived. Now his shady spot where the destruction of the city could be comfortably viewed has become hot and windy. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? The word may be depressed. Another word may be grieved. Are you grieved by that? It's not clear. And he said, I do well to be that, even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the, on the gourd, for which thou hast not labored, neither made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not spare Nineveh, that great city, where are, wherein are more than six score thousand people, who cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and also a lot of cows. <laughs> and that's how it ends. That's the last line. The shade and then its loss were the work of God, not the result of anything Jonah had done. God does what he wills. Jonah has no business wishing the destruction of the great and wicked city. God will take care of it. To underline the humor and sarcasm of the whole story, the closing line reminds us that the population of Great Nineveh is probably a little stupid. They can't get their directions straight. And there are a lot of cows. Now, we have looked at the writer of this book and at his hero, the presumed Jonah. But sarcasm demands an audience. Listeners who are the object of the witticism. We need to ask who are being told that the Assyrians are wicked and unable to tell left from right, and that nonetheless, taking Jonah's words to heart and begging for mercy, they and their cows atone for their crimes. Who is the target that needs to hear this outrageous story? Part of the answer is found in the words of Jesus in both Matthew and Luke. The same words, by the way, identically the same words in Matthew and Luke. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. The task of prophesying to Israel was generally a very dangerous business as we heard this morning by uh, Dennis. The messengers were treated with contempt and occasionally killed. Pointing out corruption and advising penance is not what the people, or we, want to hear. The word of God was, and is yet, not welcome. The same topic provokes an instance of the anger of Jesus in Acts 
we hear it echoed again by Peter. Which of the prophets have your fathers not persecuted? It should be clear that Jonah, an assigned prophet, must have met serious opposition to his delivering sermons in Israel. The Jews were not very receptive. Doing penance for bad behavior was not high on the to-do list. The book of Jonah, in contrast, tells of a reluctant prophet, that's our phrase, isn't it? The reluctant prophet. Sent to a very receptive audience in Assyria. While Israel steeped in its own evil, Nineveh was overcome with remorse, put on sackcloth, and even the animals joined in. <laughs> However, back home, no one had paid attention or shown any remorse. The preaching of Jonah is embraced by the foreigners, but ignored by the chosen people. This sarcasm would not have been lost on any reader. As a footnote, let us be clear that both approaches to the text have been taken. First, we tried to read the words carefully and tried to make sense of them. And at the same time, a great deal of outside information was brought in. And a second footnote. All the little pieces of this story of Jonah show up again in Matthew and in Luke in the Gospels, how long was Jesus in the belly of the tomb? Over and over again, Jonah provides the sign that Jesus says, pay attention. <coughs> Why Jonah? <coughs> Isaiah was so much better. <laughs> Jeremiah was. And this poor little guy. So, it's a very big deal in the New Testament, but that's another lecture. And thank you. Thank <laughs> you.